Marco Polo's million. On the bank of the Ligurian Sea is one of the oldest castles of Genoa city. It was built in 2060. The construction material was shipped from Constantinople. The embassy of Venice was destroyed in Constantinople, and in the attempt to salvage the material, it was shipped here on a special request of Genoa city authorities. For some time, this building was used as a prison, and the most famous prisoner here was Marco Polo. A prison is a prison, nothing special. Clothes and stuffy quarters, less than average food, no entertainment. In order to brighten their bleak existence, he used to tell fellow prisoners about his life, which was so unusual and full of adventures, exotic countries and exciting experiences. And this is why he told himself, it is no good that all the spectacular things I have seen or heard truthful accounts of have not been recorded for other people to read and learn from such a book. And in 1298 AD, in the Genoa prison, he had another captive, Rusticano of Pisa, record all of the stories. Chapter 1. The Polar Brothers. I will work as a gondolier, too. Dark bottom and a striped top. With his left arm, he navigates holding a single oar. With the other, he pushes off the house walls, guiding the vessel along the narrow canals with confidence. Our gondolier's name is Marco, like Marco Polo. He says it is the most common and classical of names. Every gondolier and every Venetian resident knows about Marco Polo in detail. If unsure of the details, he or she will make them up. There is a special pride to being a Venetian. Venetian Marco was born in the second half of the 20th century. Another, more famous Venetian was born in the second half of the 13th century. The state surrounded by water and the steppe are two very different things, and yet they are intimately intertwined. From the 9th century, Venice functioned as an intermediary between the East and the West. Venice was like a forepost of Western civilization in the East. They understood and were able to communicate with Eastern empires better than anyone. In 1300, as a state and as a republic, Venice was at the intersection of two worlds, and that's when it started to get rich. New markets and untapped profits, the goods were brought from Asia, silk, gemstones and spices, and remained in high demand for many centuries. Merchants Nicola and Mafia Polo specialized in spices and jewelry. Marco's father and uncle are believed to have crossed the Kazakh steppe three times. They set out on their journey in around 1260, but you have to remember that this data isn't fully reliable as there is only one information source, Marco Polo himself. So they arrived to Barca Han's dwelling. Barca received Nicola and Mafia with great respect. He was thrilled at their arrival. The brothers gave the host all the jewelry they had on them, and he took them with great pleasure. He really liked them. Barca paid double the price for all the jewelry. He also bestowed upon them other great and lavish gifts. A little prehistory. Genghis Khan shared the conquered land between his sons. Each received his own Ulus. Horezm, Western Siberia, and the Kipchak steppe went to the oldest son, Juchi. His son Batu inherited and multiplied the territory. When the merchants of Venice hit the road, the supreme ruler of the Golden Horde and the Juchi Ulus was his third son, Berke, Batu's brother and Sultan Beba's ally. There was a huge golden tent of golden color, big enough for 1,000 people. The great tent was made of Chinese silk of gold color, and because of the king's golden tent, the whole state was called the Golden Horde. But the Tatars themselves, the people of the Horde, never referred to themselves as the residents of the Golden Horde, preferring to call themselves Ulus Merkir. Gradually, the Golden Horde became independent from the great Mongolian Empire. Berkir was a patron of scientists developing trade, building sites, and mosques, he was the first Muslim in the Genghis Khan family. Until fairly recently, the Golden Horde was considered the state of wild nomads who had no cities or culture of their own. 
that they conquered the more cultured and settled peoples, basically drank their blood, extorted money from them and drove them into slavery. But in reality, it wasn't so. For one year, the brothers stayed in Berkehan's land, and when it was time to go back home, a war broke out between the Golden Horde and the state of the Hulaguits. And so the merchants had to go to China to Kublai, the supreme ruler of the Mongol state. They returned home only in 1269 as diplomatic envoys, bearing the highest letter for the Pope as an offer of friendship and cooperation. Send me a hundred scientists and artists to better equip my state, asked the Khan. Chapter 2. The Traveled Path For two years, they waited for a reply to their letter from the Vatican and reciprocating gifts for Kublai from the Pope of Rome. Then, in 1271, they set out on another journey. Although they were without scientists or artists, there were three merchants this time. Marco Polo had just turned 17, and so they took him with them. For three and a half years we travelled, enduring terrible roads, rains and crossing large rivers. Our difficulties multiplied with the onset of winter, as we could no longer travel in the same manner as we did during summer. Thus began one of the most famous travels of Marco, son of Niccolo, which lasted quarter of a century. The exact route of the journey is unknown. Supposedly, it took the travellers one to one and a half years to reach the territory of modern Kazakhstan. At the end of the 13th century, Venetians Nicola and Marco Polo crossed the territory of Western Kazakhstan en route to China. In winter, they live where there's grass and pastures for livestock. In summer, in chilly areas such as mountains and plains, grubs and pastures. They live in wooden houses, which they bind with ropes. Their dwellings are round and the people carry them around all the time. They're easy to carry, for they're firmly tied to the rods. And when they stop to set up the house, the entrance is always positioned to face south. It is best to travel through the endless step on a camel, which is exactly what they did. No one would harm them as they carried the Khan's safe conduct gold plate, Paitza. All doors in the step were open for the bearer of such a document, accommodation, transport, maintenance, anything the guest desired. From Samarkand through the Sirdarya Valley to Otrar, by that time the city had already been rebuilt and thrived once again. In the middle of the 13th century, Otrar was reborn and became the largest city known in the East. They produced coins here, supplying not only the Otrar Farab region, but also the regions of North and Central Asia. The coins are still being found today. Back in the day, they were produced in three denominations of copper, silver and gold. A major trading city, but lacking fortifications. The main difference of the Golden Horde settlements was that they were not protected by anything. It is not allowed to have walls and gates that might prevent the entry of troops. In this way, the bridled nations remain calm and undisturbed, wrote Marco Polo. They were not afraid of anyone. The state was powerful and mighty. Because the city wasn't surrounded by walls, they scattered freely and were unconfined. The settlement reached enormous proportions. From Otrar, along the foothills of the western Tanshan Mountains, along the riverbed of the Ili Rover, perhaps past the Alakol Lake and possibly through the Jungarian Gate, noting the specifics and unusual things along the way. Some of it is true. Some of it might not be. Sheep, as big as donkeys, with fat tails. The sheep are nice and fat and the meat is delicious. To prevent numerous livestock from getting lost, they are labelled with special tags. Each animal has their own. They also eat horse meat. Skilled hunters are hardly in labour and hardship. They very spend little. No other nation is better equipped to conquer kingdom and lands, for they roam a great deal. All this Marco remembered and shared with others. In battles with the enemy, they have the upper hand. They are not ashamed of running away from the enemy, and as they flee, they turn around and shoot. They have trained their horses like dogs to roll in all directions. They drink, mind you, a mare's milk. They drink it, I will tell you, like white wine, and it is very tasty. They call it Shemius. Let me tell you, their wives sell and buy everything their husbands need and take care of the household. 
Their husbands don't do any work around the house. All they do is fight in wars and hunt beasts and birds with their hawks. They found themselves in a completely different world. Different people who live differently have a different mentality, which is not always easy to understand. They manage to survive the unfamiliar, and as they describe the experience, they try to give it some kind of explanation. In general, it is rather interesting. The clash of two worlds and two different types of human mentality. The collision of two worlds ended rather peacefully. Moreover, the clever and cunning Marco, who spoke several Turkic dialects, came to the court of the Mongol Khan and became his governor. He fulfilled various delicate assignments and served the Khan a total of 17 years. And then he elicited the highest permission to return home. Little is known about his return and subsequent life, and there would have been even less information if a certain feud hadn't occurred. Chapter 3. A Million Adventures. The city Serenissima Venice, the brightest, and La Superba Ginoa, the proud, have been rivals for several centuries. To this day, neither side appears capable of sharing their common hero, Marco Polo. He was born on our territory, say Venetians. He was imprisoned here and wrote the most famous book here. In general, both sides were equally involved, as both fought for access to the Asian riches. In the first half of the 14th century, another war broke out, and the more successful Genoese captured prisoners. This is how the prison made Marco famous, and Marco made famous our prison. He never tired of praising our step, Milione, he repeated this word so frequently while describing the Khan's countless herds of cattle, jewelry, and the animals he had seen that people stopped believing him. He received a nickname Mark of the Million for his tendency to exaggerate. And why on earth wouldn't he exaggerate? He dictated his account from memory. Some things he remembered well, others not so much, and certain events would have seemed utterly fantastic if he hadn't witnessed them firsthand. I will tell you this, when the occasion calls for it, they can ride their horses for 10 days straight without food or starting fire. They tap their horses' veins and drink their blood. They also have dried milk, which is dense as dough. They carry it with them, they put it into water and stir it until it dissolves, then drink it. It remains unknown whether Marco had really lived in the land of the Mongol Khan, if he had ever crossed the Asian steppe, and who had really written this book. There's a version according to which Marco Polo had never been to Asia, but his cellmate Rusticello had. The latter was serving time for fraud in Geno, but in fact he specialized in the silk smuggling. There really was the main character. He was real. And there really was Rusticello, a part-time writer of night tales, which was so popular at the time, so he could have easily invented and embellished Polo's account in order to make the book more interesting for the readers and therefore more marketable. I will tell you about one more outlandish thing. In this kingdom, there are people with span long tails. There are many of them here. They live in the mountains, not in the cities. Their tails are as thick as a dog's. There are many unicorns and other peculiar things, animals and birds. But there were wonders that Marco actually brought back with him. Ostensibly, he was the one who conveyed to the Europeans the recipe for ice cream told them about paper money, coal, oil, and much more. There's a legend that even Italian pasta was exported by Marco Polo from the steppe. The word spaghetti, kespiete. When Marco Polo brought back with him spaghetti, the culture of ethnic food appeared. Food is everything in Italy. Italians cannot imagine life without spaghetti, without pasta. Today, up to one third of all pasta is made in Italy from Kazakh durum wheat which grows only in Italy and here in northern Kazakhstan. Original notes made in prison have not survived. Moreover, the Venetian stories were rewritten more than once, and each time someone added something of their own and omitted something of the original. Even on his deathbed, Marco continued to insist that everything he had described was absolute truth. I have not told half of what I saw.